Good morning. In our last, previous lesson, we learned how to design three column cash book. Today, we are going to look at how to set up purchases day book and the suppliers control accounts in Excel. Um, I'm adding the purchases and the suppliers sheet to the cash book so that you can have a complete system in one workbook, even though we could also separate the workbooks and then later on link them up together. But for now, we are looking at how to combine all our books into one workbook. So um, we will first of all look, have, look at uh, the first sheet to consider the items or the various information that we will need to be able to design our purchases day book. These are the information that we will need. First of all, we shall need suppliers. These suppliers are those people that we will be buying from. And for that matter, we need to have the accounts in our system so that we can assess them. So already, these suppliers are here. We had them at the time we were designing our cash book. Then the next information that we will need in our purchase book are the various items that uh, our business deal with. So in this particular exercise, we are going to work with three different classes of items or three different categories of items. We have stationary items, we have drinks, we have provisions. Just like when we're designing our cash book where we created a column for the names to assign to the various classes of accounts. The same thing applies here. We have also names to be given to the various categories of items. So in this case, the names are going to be stationary, drink, provision. One thing here is that in the cash book, you realize that the names we gave to the various classes of accounts were different from the headings. They were not the same as the headings. So you see the heading for customers is customer here, written in full, but we decided to call it as CS. In this particular case, the, the heading is stationary, the name is stationary. The heading here is drink, and the name for it is also drink. The next column, we have provision as the heading, and we have provision as the name. So when the names you are going to assign tend to be the same as the headings, then the situation of highlighting various columns before you go into the name box to provide the name could be, could be seen as a long procedure. The easiest approach, and this easiest approach only works when you find out that the headings and the names are the same. They come with the same spelling. Then you can apply that easiest approach. So we are going to see how, in this case, just by a click of a button, the names will be defined for us. Here, we need to create four names. One name for category, one name for stationary, one name for drink, one name for provision. So to do this, you highlight from the headings, that is from category, extend it to the provision and come down. So you see, where you end will determine where you can add items, just like I told you in the previous exercise. So I'm ending here. To define names from this selection or for this selection, we click on the formulas ribbon. From the formless ribbon, you will see define name session. From the define name session, we have create form selection. So we are going to create name from this area we have selected. So we, we click on the create form selection. And when you click on the create form selection, this is what we get. See create names from selection, the system is asking you a question. 
if you want to do that, you have to click OK. But before that, you see, create names from values in the top row and the left column. Because we want the top headings to serve as the names. Because this time, these top headings are the same as the names we are going to assign. So you have to remove the left button or the left column and maintain create names from values in the top row. When you finish, you click OK. So now these names have been defined in the system. If you want to find out, you see, I selected up to 17. So when I pick from row two up to row 17, I'll get the name category. You get it? When I pick from H2 to 17, I'll get the name stationary. That is also there. H2 to 17, right? The name stationary is there. When I pick from I2 to I17, the name drink is also there. J2 to J17, I get my name provision. So this is the easiest way the names could be defined in Excel. And as I said, to be able to do that, you have to ensure that the names you are you've created here are the same as the headings. Okay. Now, having done this, we will now move on to the pictures book to see how uh, the template looks like and how you can set it up. So you go to the purchases sheet, and this is the way the pictures book should be set up. When you come here, we will we have these columns. We have a column for date where the date of the transaction will be recorded. A column for supplier wherein we shall select the supplier we are buying from. A column for details. Uh, we, we should know that this particular purchase book is going to serve as the purchase day book as well as the purchase returns or what you call the returns outsource. So as a result of that, at the details column, we shall create account for purchases and account for returns outwards so that if the transaction we are recording is for purchases then we select purchases if it is for returns then we pick the purchase returns or the returns outwards under category we create a list to display the various category of items then under item we create a list to be selected based on a category that we select in this column g at the invoice number column we shall enter the invoice number See, whenever we buy from a supplier, we, are, we take invoice. So the invoice number will be captured in this column. Then we have quantity. The quantity of the item we are buying will be recorded here. The rate represents the price per unit of the item. And in this case, we shall key in the price per unit as we find on the, or as we see on the invoice. Then from there, we shall calculate our amount. And then from there, we have a column known as tax, tax type. You know, in Ghana, we have uh, the standard tax and we have the flat rate. So assuming the supplier you are buying is charging the standard tax, which is made up of VAT and health insurance, then you have to select the standard tax. If the person you are buying from is charging you the flat rate, then you have to select the flat rate. Then the next column, is for VAT, where we shall compute the VAT based on the type of tax the supplier is charging. And if the supplier is charging the standard tax, then we shall compute the value for the national health insurance levy. Then from there, we come to compute the total amount due to be paid to the supplier. Then the top here, we shall provide the, the rate, the rate for VAT, the rate for health insurance, and the rate for the flat rate. And the top here, we shall calculate the two tasks. So uh, the top here, let me, look, I forgot to, let me, it's supposed to be purchases, VAT, and the health insurance, national health insurance. So here, we shall determine the total amount that represents the total value out of this total that represent purchases. Then the VAT total will be here, health insurance total will be here. So this is how the purchase book will look like. Now, we are going to start our design, first of all, by creating a table from rule seven and eight. So I'm going to create my table from rule seven and eight. And as I told you the earlier time, 
Every time you are creating a table, you have to make sure that you've chosen my table has headers. So I take my table has headers. Then I click OK. And as soon as I create my table, I shouldn't forget to name it. See, the design ribbon is open. And at the left top here, table name. Please be careful not to provide a table name in the name box. You should always provide it at where we have table name. And when you go there, you always see table with a particular number. And that is what you have to delete so that you type in the correct table name. So I go and delete my table four. The table name is going to be purchases. So I type my table name, purchases. Now I have defined my table name. Then I click OK. Good. The date column is always reserved for entering date for the transaction. And this, this place, we don't validate here. We don't provide any formula. We leave it as it is. At the supplier column, we are going to create a list that will display all suppliers in our system. Because we are adding this to the cash book, and already within the cash book, these suppliers we name as SS, then it implies we can use the name SS to produce a list here. To create a list, I will select B8, that is below the supplier heading. Then I go to data. From data, I select data validation. Then I change from any value to list. Then in the source, because I'm using the name SS to pull out this list, I'll enter equal to SS. So when I finish, I click OK. Then I can get the list of all my suppliers showing. So this is how the supplier list will be created. Under details, as I explained earlier on, we are going to create two accounts, purchases account and purchase returns account. So I'll create a list to display these two. Therefore, I go to data validation, change from any value to list. But this time, we don't have any name for purchases as well as purchase returns. So we will not bring the equal sign at this stage. I will only type in the items I want in my list. So purchases, comma, then purchase returns. Purchases, comma, purchase returns. When I finish, I'll click OK. So I click OK here, and the list will be displayed for me. Then I go to the category column where I provide a list to show the various category of items we have in our system. And these were also named as categories. So I go to the category column, then click on data validation. We change from any value to list. And then within the sort box, I'll type in equal to category. Equal to category. Then I click OK. And this also, the list of my categories, when I go up, I'll be able to get access to them. Now on the item, we create a list to display here based on the category we select. And this is where we use the indirect function when we are creating the list. So I go to my item column, click on data validation, select list, and this time, I type equal to indirect bracket open. This item list is going to appear in column E, but it depends on what I will select in column D. So it means I have to depend on D to get E. So I'll put in D inside a bracket. And as I'm working on rule eight, then I add eight to the D. So indirect form of D8 will give me the list of items. Then I click OK. It says the source currently evaluate an error. Do you want to continue? Yes, I want to continue because I've not selected any category. So until a category is selected, I can't get any item. So when I get to the category and pick, let's say, my stationery, I get to the item side and I get a list of my stationery items. When I go to the next and pick, let's say, drink, I'll come and get all the drinks I have in my system, right? Okay, let me test for provision. 
and then we get all the provisions we have in the system right now under invoice number ideally we don't type formulas here uh, all we do is that we will enter the invoice number from the invoice we collect from the supplier but i sat down and realized that sometime when you are recording entries in your book you are likely to record a particular transaction more than once so as a computerized system i try to come out with a way i can or we can uh, prevent duplicate entries in our books and through my search i came out with a particular approach where we can use to prevent duplicate entries in our system with this approach i based on the item and the invoice number columns to determine whether a particular transaction has been recorded before or not for instance we know that when you pick any invoice on a single invoice sheet that we pick we are not likely to see the same item name repeated more than once on any particular invoice sheet we tick each item name appears once so it means that when you are recording your entries when you select a particular item and you provide the invoice number that should appear only once the moment you try to repeat the same item with the same invoice number then it tells us that you are creating a duplicate entry in your system and in that case we will expect the system to prompt us or not to allow us to proceed to our recording so this is how we are going to use or this is how we are going to do to be able to avoid duplicates in our system now what i'm trying to say is that assuming an item is pen here if pen is if pen comes here and we have invoice number 100 there is no way we can have pen again with invoice number 100 this is not right this can't be right but we can have book with invoice number 00 we can have pen with invoice number 102 this is allowed so uh, we say that an item with an invoice number can only appear in the system once so the moment you try to repeat it then the system will prompt you that you are creating duplicate entry one may ask how could this happen it is possible you are record supposing you are recording entries for the previous days you pick a particular invoice you are recording and maybe you you stand and go out for break and you return if you are not careful you are likely to record a particular invoice you have already recorded so in this case if you try to record it the system will prompt you that it is already recorded so that is what we are going to do we are going to see how we can prevent this duplicate in our system right there is a particular formula or there is a particular way we do it and um, that is exactly what you are going to do for now to do that you will select the invoice number column in fact uh, those of you who have the book with the book i have written here i have just revised the procedure for getting this done and for me anytime I'm, I'm revising a particular procedure in the book i revise it to get the, the easiest approach previously in the book we were asked to highlight enough range within the invoice column 
So if you, for instance, highlight up to row, up to row 70, and you come out with how to prevent a duplicate entry, it tells you that the system will be able to prevent a duplicate only up to row 70. That means beyond row 70, if you try to record a transaction that is already recorded in the system, the system will not prevent you. Now, I have come up with a way that we can do it without selecting the range. But no matter where you record up to, even if you are to record up to 1,000, the system will still prevent duplicates. Something you've recorded at row one, if you try to repeat it on row 1,000, the system will tell you this is already recorded. Now, this is possible because we are working within a table. Even, even if you are not working within a table, you can still do that. Yeah, so we are going to see how we can prevent duplicate. So this time, we will select the invoice number column. Then we go to data validation once again. We click on data validation here. Then we select, this time we are not going to create a list. We are going to select custom. The moment you select custom, another box comes below the screen, which is known as formula. It comes below the allow box, which is called formula. So you are going to provide a particular formula to enable us to prevent duplicate entry. The formula is equal to some product, S U M. P R O D U C T, some products combined with some product, then bracket open. Um, we select the cell containing the item, and this cell is cell E H. Then we press the column. So the moment you, you press a colon, the colon is shift plus the colon key, which comes right after L on your right side. It gives you E8 colon E8. Then the first E8 will have to be made absolute. The second E8 will have to be relative. So to make the first E8 absolute, you press F4 key on your keyboard. Those who are using desktop keyboard, you just hit the F4 key. On some laptops, you can just hit the F4 key. And majority of other laptops, you will have to combine the function key before the F4 key. So in this case, my own, I have to use the FN, that is the function key, and then the F4 key. And you see that the first EH, has become absolute, while the second E8 is still relative. So we maintain that one. Because we are using the item and the invoice number columns to prevent the duplicate, we will join the two together. Joining cells or ranges in cells in Excel is termed as concatenate. So you are going to join the item and the invoice number together, which is known as concatenate. But with this, we use a symbol to represent the function concatenate. That symbol is called ampersand, which we normally use to represent end. The symbol that we normally use to represent end. We have it on number seven, so shift plus seven. That will give us the end symbol or the ampersand. Then after this, I'll pick my invoice cell that is F8, then hit the colon once again. The moment you hit the colon, the F8 repeats itself. In this case also, the first F8 will have to be absolute. So I make the first F8 absolute. No, only the first one. Let me redo. Okay. Only the first H should be absolute. The second one should be relative. So it reads like, sorry, uh, I, I missed something from the formula. 
but I can still insert it for you, don't worry. Uh, what we should have done is that when you provide the sum product, we first open one bracket, then we type the minus sign two times. Yes, we type the minus sign two times. So in short, let me, you, let me restart the whole thing. So the function is sum product, bracket open, sum product, bracket open, then I put in the minus sign two times, <clears throat> Then open another bracket, and this is a time I have to select the cells. So I pick my E8, then colon, and the E8 repeats itself. Then immediately I will go and make the first E8 absolute. So function F4. If yours is the, the desktop keyboard, you just press the F4 key and it will be absolute. You can also decide to type it yourself. You can type in the, the dollar sign, the E and the H, the colon and the H. You can type everything without selecting. Then end. Then I pick my invoice number, colon. And I make only the first F8 absolute. Only the first F8 absolute. Right. After this, equal sign will come inside the formula again. And after the equal sign, this time I'll pick only the E8 alone. Unlike the first part where we made it E8 colon E8. No, this time only E8. And then that is the end. End. And I pick only the F8. So this is equal to E8 and F8. Now we've opened two brackets. So we need to close two brackets. This will pre prevent duplicate, but we should, we should tell the system how many times can we repeat a particular line. When I say a particular line, I mean if I have pen here and invoice number one here, that is one line. How many times can I repeat it? Each line item can be repeated only once, cannot be repeated, let me say that, can be recorded only once. So because we cannot have more than once for item on a line, then we type equal to one. So the equal to one here means that uh, if I put in pen with invoice number one, this can only appear once in the system. Assuming you have a situation where you can repeat something twice, but no more than two, then you can type equal to two. Okay. Now, at this stage, when I record entries and I, I try to uh, create duplicate, the system will just tell me they are invalid. You let's see, I'll click okay here. Let me test it for you to see. I have provision here, so I'll pick one of the items. Let's say mock, right? I'll pick mock and enter my invoice number. Let's say one, one, one. Then I go to the next line. Let me go to the next line and see. If I go and pick provision again, I'll pick provision again and pick mock again. If I should pick mock again, with the same invoice number 111. When I press the enter key, see this value doesn't match the data validation restriction defined for this cell. If this message appears on the screen for someone who don't understand the system design, how the system was designed, he may not understand himself. Why is this coming? So it means it is better we provide a better uh, explanation, a better information. To the person so that when he sees that message he will know what he is doing so in this case we are going to i'm going back to the formula and provide a very suitable error message that should in case the person tries to create a duplicate that message will appear on the screen and this person will know what he is doing so going back to the data validation Now, when I finish my formula, I go to error alert. And when I click on the error alert, there is an error message here. I'm going to provide an error message. And this error message is duplicate entry. So duplicate entry. When I click OK, now let's try. Should I put in mock here and repeat the number 111? 
duplicate entry appears on the screen. So with this, whoever is using the system will know that yes, 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 I'm, I'm trying to recall something that I have already recorded. Very good. So this is all what we do at the invoice number column. Okay. Now, the quantity, the rate, all this will be obtained from the invoice. So when you look on the invoice, you see the quantity of the item you are buying, and then you see the unit price on it. You type them at the quantity and the rate columns respectively. At the payment, at the amount column, we have to calculate the total value for the item we are buying. So we will have to multiply the quantity by the rate. Now the quantity is in J8, multiply by the rate, which is H8. So very simple formula. G8 times H8 will give us the amount. I'll enter. When I get zero, I'll just select the zero and go and click on this comma from the home menu. You see, from the home menu, where we had the number settings, I click on comma and it turns to dash. The rate column could also be formatted to give me accounting. So the rate column two, I'll select here and click on comma. Right. And the tax type. Like I said earlier on, we are going to operate with two tax systems. We have the standard tax, which comprise the VAT and health insurance, and we have the flat rate, which is 3% in Ghana here. So I'll create the two tax systems so that if I'm buying from a particular supplier who charges the standard tax, I'll pick that one. If I'm buying from a supplier who charges the, the, the flat rate, then I'll be able to select that as well. So I'll create another list here. So go to data validation. And this time I click on the settings to be able to set my list. I change from any value to list. And then go to this, the two tax systems are standard comma and flat rate. Please, you see how the flat rate has been typed. Between the flat and the rate, there is a space. Note that so that when you are creating your formula, you have to type it exit exactly the same way it is typed here. We are going to use these two terms to, 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 to determine how to calculate the VAT and the health insurance. So you make sure when you are typing the formula, you have to make use of the same spelling as we have here. Now we click OK. You will get a list of them, standard and the flat rate. Now, we move on to compute our VAT. But before that, presently, VAT, we have 15% VAT. Then we have 2.5% health insurance. And we have 3% flat rate. 15% VAT, 2.5% health insurance, and 3% flat rate. So to compute for VAT, it depends on what we choose as the, as the tax. If we choose the standard tax, VAT will be 15% of the amount. But if you choose the flat rate, VAT will be 3% of the amount. So the same VAT, it could be 15%, it could be 3%, depending on the type that we select. So under VAT, I'll put in my equal sign, then if the calculation will be based on the tax type, which is in J8. So if J8 equal to, if that is standard, I'll put the standard into quotation. If it is standard, comma, to compute my VAT, I will have to multiply the amount, which is I8, by this VAT, A2. Now, a time will come, you see now we are working on row eight. And as we are working on row eight, we are multiplying A2 by I8. When we get to row nine, it, it has to be I9 multiplied by A2. When you get to row 10, I10 multiplied by A2. So you realize that wherever you go, it's the same A2 that needs to be multiplied throughout. So in this case, if you leave the A2 relative as it is, it will be changing. The next row will give you I9 multiplied by A3. The next one will be I10 multiplied by A4, which will be wrong. 
So to be able to get the same A2 to be multiplied throughout, then this A2 has to be made absolute. So I'll make the A2 absolute so that the same A2 will be multiplied throughout wherever we go. Right, so if the tax type is standard, then we expect that the amount we have should be multiplied by the VAT of 15%, which is recorded in cell A2. The question is, why do we have to do this? Now, now that we are designing the system, we, no one knows, maybe after completing it, then the rate will change. So in that case, we just have to come to the A2 here to change the rate, and you don't have to do anything to the formula. Then comma. The VAT could be based on another tax type, which is called stand the flat rate. So in, we continue to say that if uh, uh, J8 equals flat rate, that is also into quotation. Then comma. In this case, amount, which is I8, to be multiplied by the flat rate, which is in cell C2. And this C2 is also supposed to be absolute. This C2 is also supposed to be absolute. So this is the formula. We are likely to buy from a particular supplier who is not even charging any of the taxes. So in this case, what do we expect at the VAT column? In that case, the VAT column is supposed to be empty cell. Or we can decide that the VAT column should be zero. Yes, where the person is not charging tax, VAT column could either be empty or zero. So let me this time say that our VAT column should be zero, which we will translate that to dash. Then we close with two brackets. Please, if you see in the book, instead of zero, if you see double quotation, which means the blanks, the same thing. Zero means empty cell, right? So whether you see zero or blank cell, that is the same. Now we enter. And this zero, we format that to accounting so that it will give us dash. So where no VAT is selected, we have dash. Okay. For health insurance, when you choose the flat rate, flat rate is only for VAT, no value for health insurance. So if you choose the flat rate, there will be no value here. But if you choose the standard tax, there shall be a value for health insurance. So it means that there is only one condition that requires a value to be calculated for health insurance. So the function becomes if G8, which is the tax type, equals standard. If it is standard, comma, then I8, which is the amount, multiplied by the standard, the health insurance, which is in cell B3 here, 2.5%. And this also should be made absolute. Now, apart from standard, whatever else we select in G8, the health insurance should be zero. Apart from the standard, whatever else we select in G8, health insurance should be zero. And here also, we press the enter key. And then we format this to accounting value. Now, with the total, Total will sum up amount, VAT, and health insurance. So we will have equal to sum SUM bracket open. Our amount is in I8, comma. VAT is K8, comma. Then health insurance is L8. So the sum of I8, K8, and L8 gives us the total. Then we press the enter key. Now, the next to do is to calculate the purchases. We know in accounting, when you record entries in your day book, at the end of the period, you have to do what you call postings. And when you are posting from day books into the ledgers, the total amount excluding VAT or excluding tax is transferred to purchase account. Then the individual suppliers and values will also be posted to their accounts in the purchase ledger. So the same concept is going to work here. This is the purchase account that we should have in the general ledger. So we are going to post the amount, the total for the amount 
into the purchase account. So with this, we sum up the values at the amount column. So sum bracket. We are summing from a particular table. The table name is called purchases. So I'll provide my table name purchases. See the purchases is appearing here. I double click on that. And immediately, the whole table is selected. But I'm not summing up values in the entire table. I want only the values from the amount column. So I'll open my square bracket. And thereafter, I will see all the column headings in the table. It is the amount column I'm, I want to sum. So I'll pick the amount, double click on that, and close the square bracket, followed by my round one. So the sum of amount column within the pitches table is what we transfer to the purchases account. And I enter. The same applies to the VAT. We call the sum, bracket open, my table purchases. The column I want to add is the VAT. I close my square bracket and then I enter. You see, in between the amount and the VAT, we had tax type. That is why we couldn't drag the formula. But in from the VAT and health insurance, there's nothing comes in between them. So it means I can drag it. See, when I pick here, the function shows some purchases VAT, right? Immediately I drag to the health insurance. The health insurance will show some of the health insurance column from purchases, right? Because nothing comes in between the two here within the table, so I can drag it. Now, this is the end of the purchase day book. Let me test it and see. Right. So, supposing I, I'm buying this mock 20 items at the rate of 10 CDs. See, where no tax has been selected, total is 200, amount 200, purchase is 200. The moment I pick my tax, standard tax, you see, when I pick the standard tax, it gives me a VAT of 30, health insurance of 5, and a total of 235. And these have been posted to their various accounts. When I choose my flat rate, it gives me only six at the, at the VAT column, nothing at the health insurance column. Total of 206. All right, so this is how the system should work. Now, having set up the purchase book, we can complete the supplier's account. And this could be completed in just about three minutes. But because I'm doing teaching here, I, ha I will have to take time to complete it. But when you are working it on your own, you can take maximum five minutes to set up the supplier's account. So I go to the supplier's account. The supplier's account will have the following columns. The columns required in the supplier's account include the names of the suppliers, which we can head in it as a supplier. Then we need a column where we record their opening balances. Assuming a we owe a supplier at the beginning of a particular period, their opening balances will come. Then anytime we buy from the supplier on credit, the total purchases we are making from the supplier will have to come here. So purchases, at any time we pay the supplier, payment we make to the supplier will also come. And then we will be able to compute our closing balance. So this is how the supplier control sheet should look like. Now, how do we get the supplier names? The supplier names are already on the file sheet. So I'll go and copy them. I will select all my suppliers. Or, yeah, the best way, the best way to go is that let us set up the supplier sheet so that when even we add a name on the file sheet, the name will automatically appear here instead of copy and paste. To do that, I'll hit the equal sign here. Then move on to the file sheet. When I come here, I look for the first supplier on the list, James. I click on James, and then press the enter key. James appears here. I will then pick the name and do my dragging. Place the cursor here. Let me drag up to let's say row 20. You realize that 
after the last person who is being here, the rest are zeros. So if I should go to the file sheet, let me add a new supplier. A new supplier, Jamal. The moment I go to the supplier sheet, that supplier will pick the next cell. So this is the best way we can get it so that you only have to type on the file sheet and they will be appearing on the supplier account. Okay. The opening balance column. This is where at the beginning of the period, any balance outstanding will be recorded. So here, we don't work here. So let me only format the column to give me accounting values. And the pitches column, we are, I'm going to link this column to the pitches day book so that anytime I buy from a particular supplier, total amount of purchases will be posted to this particular uh, column. If I buy from James today at 100, 100 will come there. The next day, if I buy from James at 50, then it will change to become 150. The next day, if I buy from James at 30, it will become 180. So the purchase column here keeps adding up all purchases from the supplier within a particular period. If you are deciding to keep your system in period of in less than monthly, so within the month, anytime you buy from the supplier to, to be giving you the two task purchases for that particular month. If you are keeping it quarterly, it will give you total purchases for the quarter. If you are keeping it yearly, it will give you the total purchases from the person for the year. And this one, we are going to use the function we have already learned, which is called SUME function. The SUME function requires range, criteria, and the SUMME range. Now the criteria is going to be the name of the supplier here who is in cell A2. So our criteria is going to be cell A2. The range and the sum range all will come from the purchases. Uh, it will come from the purchases, right? So you go to the purchases and when you come here, the range should be the column within the table where we can identify supplier names. Therefore, the, the range is going to be the supplier column, right? The range is going to be the supplier column. The sum range is a column where we put the amount we are owing as a result of the purchases to the supplier account. We bought 20 at 10 and it is 200. Supposing the supplier is James. Let me pick the supplier James. If the supplier is James, we bought 20 at 10 from him at 200. Now we are paying that of six, 206. If you have not paid the supplier, at any point in time you are going to pay him, it is not the 200 you are going to pay, rather you are going to pay the supplier 206. So it means that what we post into the supplier account is not the amount, rather the total. Therefore, the total column becomes the sum range. So while the supplier column is the range, the total column is the sum range. And these two are within the purchase table. So when you go to the supplier sheet, we type our function sum equal to sum if, you see the range will come from the purchases table. So I will define the table name, purchases. Then I open a square bracket. The supplier column is here, which is the range. So I'll pick my supplier column, close the square bracket. Having finished my range, I'll bring my comma. The next is the criteria. Criteria is the supplier, the first supplier I want to compute the total pitches for. Who is in cell A2? So I'll pick A2 as my criteria, then comma. The sum range is the column within the purchase table where I want to transfer the two tasks for. So this time, my sum range, I'll introduce the table name once again, purchases, and then open a square bracket. This time, it is the total column, which is the sum range. Then I close my square bracket and then the round one. So this is the sum E function, which we can use to transfer purchases from a, a supplier into his account. Equal to sum if supplier column from purchase table representing the range, A2 from this particular sheet representing the criteria, and the total column from the purchase table representing the sum range. Now I press the enter key, you see? Because I bought 206 from this person, just 206 is there. 
okay, the 206 appears here. Now, the next to do is to work on the payment. At any point in time we pay the supplier, we will effect their entries in the payment side of the cash book. So when we pay the supplier, we effect the entry in the payment side of the cash book. And when you come here, the particulars column is where we will indicate the supplier name. So it means the particulars column will serve as the range. Criteria will remain the same as the A2 we had for the purchases. That will still remain A2. But you see, because the supplier name will appear in the particulars, particulars column within the payment table will serve as a range. Some range. The sum range is going to be the gross amount. This time, it can be the cash column, it can be the bank column, it can be the discount column. The reason is that if a customer, assuming we were to pay a customer 100 CDs, and this customer give us a discount of 10 CDs, then we pay by check, then it means 90 CDs is what we pay. In recording this entry in our customer account, we know that in the, in, the, in the double entry system, you will have to debit the customer 90 CDs for the check we issue to the customer. We credit bank account with 90 CDs. Then at the same time, we, we, we debit the, the, the supplier, not customer, please. We debit the supplier by 90 CDs with the check. We credit bank account with the check, 90 CDs. We debit the supplier by 10 CDs discount, and then we credit the, uh, what do you call it? We credit the, um, the discount receive account. This is discount received. Let me copy and paste from the discount received, right? So while we debit the supplier by 10, then we credit the discount received by also 10. That is the double entry system. So it, it tells us that, in effect, the customer, the supplier account will be debited by 100. And this 100 is made up of 10 from check and then 10 from discount received. So um, because the sum if cannot be two different columns, we need only one column to use as a sum, sum range. And therefore, we, we, we take the gross amount, we take the gross amount. So the gross amount becomes our sum range, particulars is the range. Criteria will be the same as A2. So still standing here, we use the sum E function once again. The range is now coming from the payment table. And this is the particulars column. That is the range, then comma. Our criteria is still A2, comma, and our sum range also from the payment table, and this time gross amount. So this is how we can also transfer all payment made to the supplier into the supplier's account using the sum if function. We have sum if particulars column within the payment table seven as a range, criteria being the A2 because the first supplier on this particular sheet is in cell A2. Then the gross amount column within the payment table seven as a sum range, we enter. The next is the closing balance. Closing balance will be the opening balance plus the purchases minus the payment. So this is going to be B2 plus C2 minus D2. At the start of the period, how much we owe the supplier, how much we bought from the supplier, we add the two together, then we subtract how much we have paid the supplier. And the difference will give us the closing balance. We enter. Right. Because we are not working in a table for this particular case, you have to drag the formulas, right? You have to drag the formulas. You see, you see what you can you can put the cursor here and be dragging, right? Alternatively, when you, you get this cross, you just double click. 
Okay, so we drag the formula. You double, you double click here, and it fills it down to where you you selected. That is up to root twenty, right? Okay, so this is the supplier account and the purchases day book. Correct. Um, right after this, you can effect some entries. You can effect some entries. So I'm going to record some one or two entries so that we see how the whole thing operates. For instance, assuming that um, on the February 1st, 2020, so February 1st, 2020, I buy from, let's say, uh, a particular supplier, Daniel. I'll pick my purchases here. I'll pick my category here. Let's say I'm buying stationery. Then I pick my item, book, my invoice number, let's say 2578, 2587. Quantity is 200 at five cities each. And he charged the standard tax. So I pick my standard tax. Right. So you see, the first one, the first entry is made. Then on the same day, I buy from Daniel again, different item. And this is also a stationery. And let's say pen. You see, all these items will appear on one invoice. So the same invoice number. This one, 150 CDs. At two CDs. And the standard tax was charged. Okay. Now, if the following day, I'm to return some to uh, Daniel. Then, let's say on the 2nd of February, 2020, I'll pick Daniel again. This is pitches returns. And then I'll pick my stationery. Let's say I'm returning some book, books to him. Pitches returns, we raised what you call the, uh, um, the source document for pitches return is termed as a debit note because it is a note to inform the supplier that his account has been debited in our books. So we, we provide a debit note number there. Let's say we are, so we are returning 20 quantities and at this time, this 20 will have to be negated, right? So we type minus 20 the same price, which is five. When we bought, we charge the tax. So if you are returning, the tax will be selected so that it will reduce our VAT. Okay, so this is how return out was is recorded. At any point, we return to the supplier. We pick the supplier name. We select purchase returns. Then the item we return. The quantity we are returning will have to be negative. Okay, the quantity we are returning will have to be negative, And we select the tax. Now, when you get to the supplier account, you see that the total amount we are owing, we, we, we bought we bought from uh, Daniel at this stage is 1,410. And this 1,410 excludes the returns. It, it, it doesn't include the returns, right? It doesn't include it. If you pick it, these two without the returns, it gives us 1,527.5. So this one, when you pick all of them, it gives us a total of 1,410, right? So that represents how much we bought from Daniel for now. No payment has been made to him, so the closing balance is that. Now, if let's say we go and pay Daniel, we, are, we want to pay him 1,100. Uh, so we go to the payment side, let's say on the third, February third. And now Daniel is a supplier, so I pick my SS here. Then I pick Daniel account. Daniel accounts will come here. I want, I'm going to pay him 1,100. So 1,100 will be entered at the gross amount and say I pay by cash. Okay, I pay by cash. When I get to the supplier account, I will see a balance of 310. You get it, very good. So this is how the recording will be made. Now, when we buy with cash, cash purchases, to record cash purchases, what we need to do is to create an account for recording cash purchases. And this cash purchase account 
I'll create it as part of my supply. So I'll go to the suppliers column and type in cash purchases. So that anytime I buy with cash, I'll select the cash purchases. So let me see on the on the 5th of February, so February 5th, I buy with cash. So I'll pick my cash purchases here. I pick purchase accounts. This time I'm buying some drinks. Then I pick the drink I'm buying. Let's say Mota Guinness. I buy 50 crates at let's say 50 CDs each. Standard tax is selected. Then if I go to the supply sheet, I'll see that cash purchases so far is 2937.5. Cash purchases shouldn't be part of supplier balances. So you realize that now this column represents supplier balances that should be transferred to our tire balance and our balance sheet. But this cash purchases should, should not be part of supplier balances. So immediately we go into the payment side of the cash book to effect the entry, right? Because we have paid the supplier. So 2937.5, I go to the cash book on the 5th. That is the same day, February 5th. SS, because cash purchases is created under suppliers. I pick my cash purchases. How much was it? 2937.5. So I put in 2937.5. SA, I pay with check. Supposing, okay, I paid with cash. I went with cash. Now, when I get to the supplier, see there is no balance outstanding for cash purchases. The next day, if I buy with cash again, let's say on the seas. So, February 6, cash purchases again. I pick my purchase account again. Now, this time I'm buying some provisions. Buying some provisions, let's say mock 20 at 20 cities, standard tax, another on the same day. Okay, so another purchases, another provision, this time Milo. Below 30 quantities at let's say 35 cities and the standard tax. Okay, so when I get to the supplier account, you realize that so far total cash purchases is 4,641.25. What has been affected in the cash book is 2,937.5. What is here to go to cash book? 1,703.75. So it means that this is what we have not entered in the cash book, right? Good. So this time, I'll go into the cash book and effect that particular entry. So 6th of February, cash purchases again. And this is 1,703.75. Right. This is also in cash. Now, when you get to the supplier account, you see there is no balance. So at any point in time, there should not be a closing balance for cash purchases. But all other suppliers could have closing balances. This is how the purchases and the supplier's account is maintained in Excel. I urge you all to be practicing. If if this is the first time you, you, are, you are coming here, I, I advise you watch the previous videos for you to be able to understand this better. Thank you very much. We shall meet once again.